Bienvenidos todo el mundo a la Ciudad de México. We are at one of the most important museums in the entire world. El Museo Nacional de Antropología, National Museum of Anthropology. And what we're looking at right now is one of the most important works of the Mesoamerican world. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. Today, we're going to see Aztec artifacts and from the other Mesoamerican tribes and kingdoms. Let me know where you're watching from. Also, a little bit later, we're going to learn about one of the largest heists in all of our history. So I will be whispering in order to maintain the peace of the place, but yes, I am indeed allowed to film here. You just have to pay a little bit extra. I had to pay uh, 50 pesos extra, which is a little bit more than $2 in order to film. Let's go. The museum is located at right by Chapultepec Park. It's one of a few museums in this area. And before I talk about the main stone right there in the center and one of the stranger sculptures in this entire museum, I'm going to talk about the Tenochtitlan. So let's go around and see first a few of the other artifacts. So this room is mostly Aztec artifacts. Now the Aztecs really only started in the late 1300s, early 1400s. They've only really been around for a little bit more than 100 years, 200 years or so, uh, when the Spaniards came. They were the Mexica people. And the Mexica at first were nomads roaming the lands of central Mexico. Mexica is where we get the word Mexico, Mexico. If you were to spell Mexico before, you were, you generally spell it more with the J or the X. So how did the Mexica people turn into what we know today as the Aztecs. Well, what is the word Aztec? Well, that goes of the Mexica. The Mexica said that they came from a world, a land called Aztlan. Aztlan, no one knows exactly where it's supposed to be, but bears very strong resemblance to another myth about a uh, mysterious world that disappeared called Atlantis. <laughs> Not sure if they're related, but some people think they are. Nonetheless, the word Aztec came from Aztlan from European scholars, but they called themselves Mexica. They worshiped a god called Huitzilopochtli. I'm oversimplifying it because many of the gods had different aspects it wasn't quite like greek gods or roman gods that represented one or two things um, many of the gods represented many things they were much more complex but huitzilopochtli in a very simplified version was the god of war he his earthly incarnation at least one of them was a hummingbird and according to the foundation myth of the aztec empire was that Huitzilopochtli told one of the main priests that you will find a great home, a place filled with abundance, where there is a lake, and inside that lake there is an island, and on that island there is a cactus, and on that cactus there is an eagle, and that eagle is eating a snake, and there is the promised land. Well, the Mexica end up finding that promised land in Tenochtitlan the land which is now 
center of Mexico City. So hello everyone, welcome to see you here. But what is the Nochitlan? They have an excellent depiction of it, which I'm going to show it to you soon. Here it is. So, from the Valley of Mexico. So the Valley of Mexico is modern day Mexico City, which is within the state of Mexico, which is within the greater country of Mexico, which is known as the United States of Mexico officially. And the Nochitlan is right there in the center. And the flag today, to this day, the Mexican flag is that eagle, that snake, that cactus on that little piece of land. Right now, modern day Mexico City encompasses most of the lake, which has been filled in with the exception of further in the south, where you see still some of the uh, leftovers of the lake. Now, of course, there was a bunch of other tribes all around in these mountains. So the Mexica, the Aztecs, weren't an empire in the sense of like the Romans, which was very centralized. That means that there were other rulers nearby. But these other rulers um, pay tribute to the Aztecs. So Coyoacán, we see right here, Coyoacán, and like the local should be nearby. There's a bunch of others. Tepanec. How many, how many different sections of Aztec artifacts? There should be only one. Hello, Wendy, nice to see you here. So welcome everyone, I'm so excited to visit this museum. I have to put the backpack in front, so pro tip, if you're coming to um, Mexican museums, <laughs> get yourself a tote bag and they won't give you so much of an issue. But here, in most museums, they ask oh, I'm carrying another urbanist baby over here. Espectacular, vi con los detalles, lo padre, oh sí, bien espectacular, eso sí. Steven says, thank you for the tour, my pleasure, Steven. The place where the eagle cries spreads out its wings and eats the place where fish swim the place where the snake is torn mexico tenochtitlan and many things will come about tells of the foundation of mexico tenochtitlan with the eagle and the nopal devouring the snake in the Azcatitlan Codex, the place where the city was founded is represented by a man sacrificed on a pyramid, from which emerges a nopal, the Tenochtli, while the Mendocino Codex shows a proud eagle on the nopal in the center of Mexico Tenochtitlan, the notable symbol of triumph in war. At present, the Mexican national emblem represents the end of this long journey with the image of the sign promised by Huitzilopochtli. The eagle on the nopal devouring a snake, indicating the spot where the Mexicas would found their city of Mexico Tenochtitlan. From there, they would spread their rule, power, and culture to all regions of the known world. The history of Mexico will follow its course, but will not free itself from the myth of its pre-Hispanic origins to which its roots are cemented. Hey 
Hey Diana, hey Andre, hey Yahya, nice to see you here. Welcome everyone. I don't know, in such rich history, a lot of stuff happened, yeah, in those few hundred years before the Spaniards. Hey Akshan, nice to see you here. The simplicity of the museum highlights the context. Yeah, it does. Look at that. I love the design. It feels very open. Unlike other museums that could feel rather cramped. So why eagle eating a snake, says Matt. Oh, that's a good question. Matt, that's an excellent question. So think about this. What does a snake usually represent? And it's interesting that snake represents almost the same thing everywhere. Across the entire world, snakes usually represent a few distinct characteristics. So let me know. What do they represent? And then an eagle. Eagle tends to also represent similar characteristics across many different uh, cultures around the world. So yeah, snake usually represents evil. It represents deception. It represents um, uh, in the shadows, and the eagle is usually kind of a heroic, courageous, um, a defender. So, in essence, it's saying that this land might be very wild, this land might be very hostile, but here there's someone to defend it, there's a thing. That might be the reason. And generally, I would, I would recommend making educated guesses with these things because myths, myths have similarities across the entire world. Why is that the case? Well, that's for a very different discussion, but it is the case. Hey, Dennis, nice to see you here. Welcome. Colleen, loving your walks. How was Mexico? I'm loving it. Absolutely amazing place. So here we have one of the soldiers. A depiction of a soldier. Guerrero Aguila, which means a soldier, eagle soldier. So soldiers in Aztec Empire dressed up as a, a few different animals, but there were two main ones. There was the eagle, like this guy over here, or an eagle, and he's a very high rank. Uh, but among the very, very, very high ranking soldiers were the ones wearing... Right? Yeah. <laughs> ding ding ding. They were in the leopard, uh, the jaguar, the jaguar pattern. Like skins. Obsidian. Is this obsidian? It might be something similar. A knife. So everyone, uh, what was just announced was uh, to maintain social distance and to have your mask above your nose. 
but I've noticed Mexicans are a lot better with that than Americans are. <laughs> Tough time putting the mask above the nose, but here they don't. Uh, but yeah, they're just announcing that. Buen día, John. Qué maravilla. Disfruta este museo. Encontrarás todas las coincidencias de los lugares que visitaste en el centro histórico. Gracias, sí. A mí me encanta este museo. Es bien bonito. Y sí, hay un montón de piezas bien importantes a la historia mesoamericana. So, uh, Jan says, uh, here we'll find a lot of artifacts that are featured in our walks that we've done the past few days. Are there people that shoot shoot betel nut? Betel nut is from, I think, S Central Asia or Southeast Asia. I don't think be there's I don't think there's betel nut here in uh, Mexico, or well, at least it's not popular. Did Aztecs witness UFO sightings? Oh, great question. I don't know. I don't know. But yes, cannibalism indeed was real and common. In Aztec culture, ritual sacrifice was systemized. It was not something they did once a year. It was something they did at least once a month. And it was a systemized process. So here we have, ladies and gentlemen, Tenochtitlan, which is modern-day Mexico City, or at least the center historic of Mexico City. This is a scaled version of it. That right there is the Templo Mayor. The cathedral would be built right next to it, right there, currently. Robert says some explorers and conquistadors were killed in Eden. Yes, such as Hernán de Soto, right? That's correct. The Aztecs had no resistance to Western diseases? No, no, they didn't, uh, Diana. The reason, and here's a, a illustration of the Tenochtitlan. This is how it would have looked like. Again, there's a lot of written records, there's a lot of drawings, there's a lot of first-hand accounts of Tenochtitlan, of Aztec culture. What we're talking about here, what I'm showing here, none of it is exaggeration or speculation. Uh, it is very well recorded part of history. So no, this is not some fiction, uh, fictional land <laughs> made up by uh, Spaniards who were high on psilocybin. No, this was real, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This was Tenochtitlan. And they were stunned when they came here, the Spaniards. Here we see all the chinampas. The chinampas are basically were floating farms. Right there's the main center, Tenochtitlan. And this was the Axis Mundi of the Aztec world, which means this was the center of their universe, in essence. You know, uh, for some other cultures, that's not always the, always the case. Um, but for them, it was. Like, Tenochtitlan was the center of everything. Culture, religion, uh, myth, government, warring, everything. Thirteen forty-five to fifteen twenty-one. Thank you, Tammy. Yep. Just a little bit under two hundred years. Now, the Magica by no means were the first empire here, or the first um, 
civilization. There was many others. So what is this? This is a This is an Aztec calendar. The sun god right there. But what does it say? It says something that still terrifies people to this day, at least the ones who And as with any type of myth around the world, there's always an ounce of truth in them at the very least. It's the stone of the sun. And it, it's not a calendar per se in terms of it telling exactly uh, what happens. You can't really read the months or the years, but you can read the cosmological um, things that are going to happen. <clears throat> it was discovered in December 1790 in the Plaza Mayor, which was right by where we visited uh, in the first video, right by the cathedral. And it was used as a huge sacrificial altar. But one of the interesting things is right here in the center. So how do we know how old this is? Well, first of all, right over here. It's a little bit hard to see, but right over there, right this. That's a insignia of Moctezuma II. So this was built in his reign. So this was built around the rain. Of our boy Moctezuma. The second. But this tells a terrible prophecy. Because it tells of the first previous earths. The first previous incarnations of our earthly realm. One. The first world, the first sun, was destroyed by jaguars. Eden, everyone was eaten by jaguars. The second sun was destroyed by wind. Earth was windswept to utter destruction. The third sun was rain of fire. Yep, literally, fire rained on this earth. And the fourth sun is water. A great flood took over these lands. <clears throat> but what is the fifth sun? Well, we are living that through that right now. And these huge snakes you see right here, these are snakes. And we can see their heads over here. And they have heads of men. These are the ones who keep the sun and the moon going, revolving around the earth. But the fifth sun, which we're living through right now, is prophesized in this cosmological calendar that we are all going to perish under a great disaster of a massive earth-shattering earthquake. So myth always has an ounce of truth in it. And here we can see the tiny little ounces of truth. First they say wind. 
Wind I don't know too much about, or Jaguars. But I do know about the last two. Rains of fire. So throughout human history, when we've been here alive on this earth, there's been instances of massive volcanoes that have turned the sky red. Uh, there was one in Central America, and there was one, uh, I think it was around Asia, uh, that nearly ex made the human race extinct. And one thing that was the extremely red sky. And if they were closer, they would see the sky literally falling. They would see a bunch of ash. They would see molten rock coming towards their way. So that is one of the nature, na biggest natural disasters that could have, that did happen here on this earth, that could have been passed down through some oral tradition or through some emotional ancestral trauma that it was embedded into our myths. And then the other one is rain, water. So there is a great flood myth in every single culture around the world. Every single culture has a flood myth, including the Aztecs. Now, is this made up? Is this a pure coincidence that place has a flood myth? Noah or the, the flood myths of India, you can find them everywhere. Well, this indicates that something happened and there is some evidence that during our human history that we can record uh, about 12,000 years ago, there was a massive flood that nearly exterminated humanity. So floods have happened on large scales. No one can still verify if something happened on such a large scale that the entire world experienced it yet. But if it's in every single myth, it might point to something that happened. So <laughs> about earthquakes, I'm not sure. <laughs> Whoever made this was a genius of his time. Yeah, you can think uh, during Moctezuma's reign. 1510, so it wasn't that while, while back. A lot of stuff was happening in Europe in the 1510s. <laughs> the Protestant Reformation, right? Uh, the Inquisition. <laughs> Crazy stuff was happening in Europe at that time. And here we have the most disturbing of all the statues. The statue that was rediscovered here next to a Plaza Mayor, a Templo Mayor, in the middle of Mexico's historic center, Cautlicue. Cautlicue was so disturbing to the people who uncovered it that they reburied it. Why does it look disturbing? Let me know. Let me know what you think as we take a look at it. What looks disturbing to you? I mean, just looking at it you know, superficially gives me kind of the creeps. I remember reading about an eagle and a flood in, in Lakatoa myth. Yep, BB, literally every single culture has some type of flood myth. Every single culture. The face has fangs, yep. That's one thing. That's one thing, fangs, okay? It's a bit disturbing. What else? It's grotesque, it looks like a gargoyle. Yeah, yeah, it is grotesque. Let me know if you spot anything else. There's something the, there's something even more creepy about it. And this is a goddess, yeah, this got liquid. This is the mother of Huitzilopochtli, the god that the Aztecs worshiped. There's a skull, yeah. She's wearing a skull. And what does she have around her neck? There's snakes. Oh yeah, there are snakes. I'll tell you what they represent. But what does she have around her neck? What is this necklace? Has a head on the waist. Yep, that is a skull on the necklace or on the, as the belt. Yep, ladies and gentlemen. So Count Likwe, the mother of Huitzilopochtli. 
Ashley, the war god that the Aztecs worshipped and killed thousands of people in ritual sacrifice. She had hands and legs on her necklace right here. So she was literally wearing a necklace of dismembered parts, human parts. Aside from that, there's now a lot of little kids around me, so this might be disturbing for kids. Uh, right above, we see the head. No, this is not the head. She's actually missing her head. In Aztec culture, a common motif is snakes. Snakes represent, if you see any type of humanoid sculpture, it represents spurting blood. So she is decapitated and uh, her blood is spilling out, hence the snakes. Same thing with the snakes on her arms, because her arms were also cut off. You can see the outline of her breasts right there in the center. And what does the word Kaulikwe mean in the first place? I might be mispronouncing it. Pardon all the Nahuatl speakers out there. It means skirt of serpents. With a bunch of serpents. And she has talons and claws for her feet. So a very disturbing image for the mother goddess. Or at least one of them. So now you can see how disturbing this might have seemed to the Spaniards first time they came here and saw this in the middle of the town square. So here's a image of how it looks like in full color because a lot of these sculptures were indeed painted. This is like a horror movie. I actually like horror movies. Oh, Duane, yeah. Yeah, Duane. I see why I was buried again. Aliens. No, this is not alien. It's, it, it, uh, Kaliqua was humanoid, so she looked like a human. She quite didn't look too alien like uh, some of the other ones. This just gives me a pit in my stomach. Ooh. It's really kind of disturbing to look at it. So, Dwayne says he likes horror movies. I am surprised that there's not more horror movies about the Aztecs. Uh, because it is, like, you don't need to make anything up. You can make a, a completely true story of uh, one of the ritual sacrifices that happened under the rule of Tlacacal. Tlacacal? And uh, he was one of the worst ones. He was uh, two rulers before Moctezuma. And you would not need to exaggerate anything. You would not need to make up anything. You can literally make it as if it were like a, re a documentary recreation. And it would be a horror film. For example, a good context. Um, George R. R. Martin, the writer of Game of Thrones said that uh, in the third book there's this event called the Red Wedding. I won't spoil it for anyone but if, you know, if you're a Game of Thrones fan you probably know what I'm talking about. It's a very steeply shocking scene. So George R. R. Martin said that his books are heavily inspired by real he wrote that scene as if it were real history. It would have been more bloody and it could not be for a book nor definitely a television show it would not be allowed on tv if you were to do it based on history and that he, that's referring to um scottish history in that instance if you were to put aztec history some of these events in in a movie i don't think it would be allowed in theaters she's a lot scarier than the chancleta that's for sure says dora yeah Most of the signs are in Spanish here. But yeah, it means La Farta de los Serpientes. Serpents, serpent skirt. That's her name, serpent skirt. Oh, okay. Ooh, creepy. <laughs> okay. 
I get a pit of my stomach coming out uh, seeing this. And look, she has another human skull in the back. And more human hands in the back. Oh my god, she has quite a collection. If it sounds like I'm being judgy, um, I am. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm, I'm very disturbed by Aztec history. Very, very disturbed. Personally, let me know what you think. I'm personally like, creeped out by it. Griffin, who are you referring to? Los Caminos says she's a symbol, not a goddess. She is. It's literally a goddess. She's the, the mother of Huitzilopochtli. Literally. I mean, not, not literally, but within the myth. She's the mother of Huitzilopochtli. So it's a real, like, not real, but in the in the terms of myth, it was an actual being. Not a metaphor. <laughs> This, this culture really explored the dark side. They did. I think they did. Give directors ideas, says Gigi. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Ronald, who are you referring to? I think humans are still just as scary sometimes. They are, though I don't think you find that too much nowadays. Dwayne says, I'm a cinematography buff, but I don't know how a movie like this would pan out. Yeah, yeah. It would, that like if you were to cover some of those events, it would be really extreme of a film. Kay says this is fascinating. I'm glad you think he, uh, you think so. Dora says it is disturbing because it goes against human nature and preservation of self. Yeah, I agree. Some of the things you mentioned yesterday about the Aztecs remind me of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yeah, that's the downside um, of uh, these films, uh, Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom, it, it seems like they're... You know, when it comes to history, of course, it's usually written by the people who survive. Or, or have one and can uh, print their books and make sure everyone reads their story. Um, and while some of those films, like Indiana Jones or some other um, more like these adventure films, like The Mummy, might exaggerate certain elements from our Eurocentric point of view, the Aztecs, they also have very good written records of their ritual sacrifices and the systems that they had. They had immense records on it. On it. So it's not something that's just only one-sided from the Spaniards.
<laughs> I don't know that, so would you would consider visiting uh, in that Aztecers, <laughs> Aztec era, if they had a buffet of avocado toast and espresso, I would doubt they would have that. <laughs> are they made of stone or clay? They're made of stone. On the these figurines are made, out, I think, of clay. Some of them. Some of them are stone. I think. Some stone, some clay. Volcanic stone a lot of them. Stay tuned, I have one more story for all of you about one of the biggest heists in our history that transpired in this very museum. But we gotta go to the other rooms for that. Was it the Aztecs who drugged themselves and mutilated the private areas? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if the Aztec priests do that. But there are reports, there are records of Aztec priests flaying skins and flaying human skins and wearing them. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they also took uh, psilocybin. And uh, I'm not sure if they took another drug, but psilocybin was one of the drugs they took, which is shrooms. Because this museum is gigantic, I'm taking my sweet time in just one part. Oh, this is beautiful. What's what was the meaning of these little statues? Oh, I don't know uh, a lot of the meanings. They do have the written things in in Spanish, though. Uh, so, I'll read uh, with the upcoming ones I see. Gwen says cactus, not mushrooms. They did, they, oh, well, um, they did have access to cactus, but they did also have access to psilocybin. So psilocybin, uh, there was a version of psilocybin here in the Americas that's indigenous to Mexico, a version of psilocybin. Uh, if anyone knows the official name, but yes, they, they also use psilocybin, aside from cactus. How much internet does it take to broadcast? About one to three gigabytes. All right, so let's go, I'll show you the other, because there, we're gonna see a lot of the same stuff around here. So, Vivi says another interesting point. Uh, you can't take myth as history. I get it. But the reasons the Aztecs did these ritual sacrifices were because they were...